In this video, we're going to make a vampire survivors inspired game, but reimagined as an outer space sci-fi shooter with a 10 second twist. What's the twist? The player is going to change colors between orange and blue every 10 seconds. All the enemies in the game are either orange or blue. While the player ship is orange, you can damage orange enemies, but you have to run away from blue ones. While the ship is blue, you can damage blue enemies, but you have to stay away from orange ones. The player's emotions in that flip moment would be reminiscent of that moment in Pac-Man when you touch a power pill. One moment you're running from the enemies and then the event happens and triggers a flip and the player gets to feel like the tables have turned. Oh yeah, ghosts, what you got now? We're gonna look at how a non-artist like myself can use geometry and programmatic effects to make the game look better. We'll be looking at some enemy spawning techniques. There's a number of other design decisions we'll cover. And at the end of this video, I'll show you the super simple change that single-handedly made the game more learnable for new players. Celestial Survivors was made in three days for the Ludum Dari 51 Game Jam, which had the theme every 10 seconds. I was brainstorming some ideas and I noticed that all of them had to do with treating every 10 seconds as a penalty. Do a task in 10 seconds. Do something every 10 seconds or you're dead. But then I thought, hey, wait, turn that around. Instead of being a penalty or a requirement, let's make it an exciting moment, like that Pac-Man game where there's a turn the tables event. I thought back to an old arcade shooter called Ikaruga. In Ikaruga, the player could switch between black and white. Furthermore, you could absorb enemy bullets of the same color. Separately, I've been playing a lot of Vampire Survivors in the weeks leading up to the jam, and that got me thinking, hmm, what if I combine Vampire Survivors with the color switching mechanic of Ikaruga, but with the color switch happening on 10 second time intervals? The player would be encouraged to act aggressively against enemies of the same color while running and trying to avoid enemies of the opposite color. Then, every 10 seconds, it would flip. Vampire Survivors has a number of mechanisms to encourage the player to move. The most core of this is the XP and coins that drop. Without this mechanic, certain weapon setups would allow the player to simply stand in the center of the screen without moving. The color switching mechanic removed the need to have this incentive. Since you can't hurt enemies of the opposite color, you have to move in order to avoid getting hit by enemies of the opposite color. For this reason, I got rid of XP and gold as pickups and let the player focus on avoiding enemies and trying to defeat them. In retrospect, I'm not sure if this was the right move. After all, trying to pick up experience globes is in and it of itself a fun activity. At the same time, it's always a good game design practice to remove mechanics to simplify the game whenever possible. In the context of a game jam, it seemed worth trying. Let's talk about the music. Since we know the player is going to switch colors every 10 seconds, I wanted the music to help reinforce this sense of time for the player. When it comes to the core game mechanic of your game, it's helpful to reinforce important elements of your design with additional feedback. Sometimes this means additional visual cues, but auditory cues are also powerful, and musical cues can be very powerful. In music composition, music is broken up into measures, and most commonly there are four beats to a measure. Furthermore, the measures are often grouped themselves into a four measure phrase. A pattern of four measures sounds naturally pleasing to our ears. This gives us a total of 16 beats in a four measure phrase. To give players an audio cue that the color is going to change, let's time the music so that every four measures is 10 seconds. In other words, there is 16 beats in 10 seconds. If there's 16 beats in 10 seconds, then there's 96 beats in 60 seconds. This tells us that the music should be 96 BPM. Here's a sample of 96 BPM music. Notice how the musicality of the phrases hint at when the color change is going to happen. And there's the color change. I'm not an artist, so to keep things simple, the player is a 20-sided die, or more specifically, an icosahedron. Meanwhile, the enemies are four-sided dice, also known as a tetrahedron. These geometries are made very easily in Blender. First go into Edit, Preferences, Add-ons, and ensure Add Mesh Extra Objects is on. Then you can go to Add Mesh Math Function, and then add a regular solid, and bam, a tetrahedron geometry is there. For our 20-sided, we simply pick icosahedron from the creation dialog box. 
easy peasy geometric enemies for non-artists like myself. Speaking of making your game look nicer if you're not good at art, an easy way to amp your visuals is to add a full screen bloom effect. It takes less than a minute to set up and check this out. Here's the game without bloom and here it is with bloom. Let me show you that again, without bloom and then with bloom. All right, now that we have some nice looking enemies, let's talk about how they spawn and how they move towards the player. My first naive approach to spawning enemies was to simply imagine a circle around the player that was slightly larger than the screen size. Enemies would be spawned at random points on that circle. When I tried this though, I found it felt too chaotic. I wanted enemies to feel like they were coming in packs towards the player, but this approach had them coming in scattered. It wasn't interesting. After trying a few different algorithms, I landed on an approach as follows. First, pick a spot in the circle like before, but once that point is chosen, remember it. After an enemy is spawned, rotate that point by plus or minus five degrees around the circle. Then spawn another enemy. Each time an enemy should spawn, jitter by up to five degrees in either direction. Remember that the enemies start moving towards the player on spawn, so they'll space out a bit and be separated from each other. Finally, every five to 10 seconds, change the spawning cone to a totally different position based on which direction the player is currently moving. Choose a random spot within that new cone and begin spawning enemies there. And you might be wondering, why did we move the cone to be in the direction the player is moving? Well, the player is often moving away from danger, so why not spawn some enemies in the direction the player is moving to try and trap them from the other side? Once we got enemies spawning down, next came designing some upgrades. I came up with five different upgrades for the ship. First, we have three basic upgrades that feel a little generic, but are nice to have available for the player. We have a wider beam auto attack, a farther range auto attack, or faster movement speed. While not terribly sexy, these upgrades are easy to understand, but to pique the player's interest, I also added three additional systems, photon torpedoes, phaser array, and guardian orbs. An important principle when designing upgrades in a game is to make sure each upgrade has a clear and unique property. As a designer, you want to be able to clearly state what makes each weapon system different than the others. Photon Torpedoes. This fires projectiles at enemies periodically. The advantage would be that the torpedoes have good damage output and full screen range. The disadvantage would be that they only fire on a fixed time interval, so sometimes they don't fire when you really need them to. Another disadvantage is you don't get to pick the targets so the torpedoes might take out some far away enemies while leaving behind a threatening foe that's in your face. The second weapon system is the phaser array. This fires phasers at nearby enemies. To make the gameplay more interesting, the phasers draw energy from a battery. The charge of the battery is represented on the top of the screen. The battery doesn't charge while the phasers are shooting, but after a brief delay, the battery can start to charge up. The advantage of the phaser array would be that it always shoots the closest enemy of the same color, which is presumably the most threatening to you. And another advantage of the phaser array would be that if you could play it perfectly with your charging and discharging cycles, we would allow this to do more overall damage than the torpedoes. The disadvantage of the phaser array is that it's, you know, a relatively short range weapon. And if you're not able to set up situations where you can always get optimal distance to charge and, and discharge your battery, then it's gonna be a little less efficient. And finally, the Guardian Orb. The Guardian Orb orbits the player until an enemy is right next to the player. As soon as an enemy is that close, the Guardian Orb self-destructs and takes the enemy out with it. If you get multiple upgrades in Guardian Orb, this will allow multiple orbs to circle you, protecting against multiple enemy collisions. The special advantage of the Guardian Orb is that it could destroy enemies of either color. It's the only weapon system in the game capable of doing this. The disadvantage is that the Guardian Orb has no range at all and has the lowest damage output over time. The torpedoes are good at doing damage, but not always the enemies that you want to hit. The phasers are good at damaging nearby enemies, but have limited range and can run out of battery. The Guardian Orb has the lowest damage output, but can protect you from the opposite color. Deliberately thinking about how your upgrades can fill unique niche roles 
will make your game more interesting. Let's take a look at what makes the missiles look cool as they travel to their target. The missiles follow a Bezier curve. I use Bezier curves a lot in my game jams. Like when I use the Bezier curve to plot out the path in my Music Rhythm Runner, which I also did a game jam recap on, I'll have a link to that video in the description below. Bezier curves are seen in many places, such as when you're drawing curves in applications like Photoshop. The endpoints are fixed and then two intermediate points pull the curve in a particular direction to help shape the curve. In this game jam, the missiles follow a path by having the starting point of the Bezier curve be the player and the final point be the ship you want to hit. And then we randomly pick two points in between. This causes each missile to take a random curve as they head towards the target. To really accentuate the cool curve, the torpedo has a trail on them. Here's what the missiles look like without trails, and here are the torpedoes with trails. I stream all my Ludum Dari game jams on Twitch, and on the last day of the jam, one of my viewers mentioned that he couldn't tell the difference between the two colors easily because he was colorblind. By the way, if you're interested in seeing me make a game live, do join me for a Ludum Dari at twitch.tv slash candlesun. So while I was streaming, the viewer pointed out that he couldn't tell the difference, and that's because at the start of the jam, I had chosen pink and yellow as the two colors the player would alternate between. I know that the most common type of color blindness is red-green, but a less common form of color blindness is known as tritonopia, which makes it hard to tell the difference between yellow and pink. I spent a little bit of time during the jam researching alternate color possibilities and settled on orange and cyan. For a full game, it would be great to add full color customization, but that was outside the scope of this game jam. Aside from color options, it's never a good idea to base your whole game on players being able to tell the difference between two colors. This would present a serious accessibility issue. So to help this, I also changed it up so that the enemies that you shoot are solid tetrahedrons, while the enemies you can't shoot appear more wireframe. This allows anybody to tell the difference between the two states without the need for a color at all. As a bonus, this change makes the enemies more recognizable even if you're not colorblind. This is actually a pretty common result. When you design a game for accessibility, the feature can often benefit everybody. Near the end of the jam, I had my wife playtest the game as well as some friends and my viewers on Twitch. Here's how everybody's first game went. Do you see what happened? The player is taking damage from the enemy, but the player has no idea. The indication that you're taking damage is these progress bars at the bottom of the screen, but that's not where the player's eye is. When a player is new to the game, they can't be expected to look everywhere. Most players are probably looking here at their ship or here at the enemy closest to them. They're not gonna notice a health bar shrinking at the bottom of the screen. Two changes fixed all that. First, I added a very loud and obnoxious effect directly on the player every time you take damage. And secondly, I added a sound effect that was almost like static. It's a super annoying sound and it almost grates on your nerves, but it's an immediate indication to the player, bad thing happening, get out. Every playtester after that understood very quickly when they were being damaged and to avoid that danger. If you want to give the game a try, I'll leave a link to the game in the description below. Thanks for joining me and happy game making.